Om Satyena Labyas Tapasa Hyesa Atma Samyagyanena Brahmacharena Nityam Antaha Sharirehi Jyotir Mayo Hi Shubraha Yam Pashanti Yataiha Kshina Doshaha Om Shanti 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 The Atman, the indivisible self, in all beings and all things is realized by moderation, by knowledge, by austerity, and by veracity. All of these constantly cultivated. When mental impurities dissolve due to this practice, then the seer beholds it everywhere, existing in everything even here in this very mind and body. Om peace, peace, peace. May that reality protect us, may it sustain us, and may it illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world and with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tatsat. As usual, we welcome you all to SRV Loka, that is that ashram of both the gross and subtle realms. Where you can find us on the computer, on your website. You can also find us doing the live broadcasting uh, as often as we can for those people who like to come as close to possible as uh, as it gets with a live transmission, if you can be in the same room. We call that holy company with one another when we can all get together. But this is our third class in this series already, and <clears throat> we find ourselves with a new chart that I've developed because I was uh, thinking that I probably would do that because the first chart is um, something that we went through last time, or is this a second second class maybe, yeah. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it. Um, but it's going to be a month of Sundays five Sundays. So this second class correction, uh, I did manage to come up with a new chart for us to look at, which explains more of the dynamics of perception around these darshanas. We find ourselves here, as far as time is concerned, in a holy period of sacred birthdays, Jayantis and pujas for our particular order, Ramakrishna order, having just been aware of and celebrated Swami Shardin on his birthday and Swami Turian on his birthday, direct disciples of the great master. And Christmas, of course, our own founder, Lex Hickson, was born on Christmas, passed away on All Saints Day, too. So a lot of auspicious days and for this particular class series, we're looking at qualification, mainly as seen by Swami Vivekananda and his birthday, both his solar and his lunar birthdays, because they do tend to look at both of those calendars in India, are on the 12th and 14th of this month. So they're coming up soon. And so that makes it a very fitting and auspicious time to dive deeper into this beautiful and might might say necessary in all paths and all religions and even in all walks of life, the special feature of qualification based upon analysis of the participating self. In the case of Vedanta and Yoga and Indian darshans that we'll be talking about, that self is the indivisible one, which I just chanted about 
the individual one has to um, rise. Like a, a bird on a lower branch of a tree flies up to be with its mate on the upper branch of the tree. Or if you want to put it in Kundalini system, which we'll be talking about probably next week, bring that presence from lower centers of consciousness and raise it with your self-effort, with your spiritual self-effort to higher centers, particularly if you can raise it beyond the three lower centers or what's called the three worlds and bring it to the heart. Then if you can function as consciousness from the heart center, which is the fourth chakra and beyond the three worlds, then you will have the return of these fruits of life, spiritual fruits of life, which are unique to what they call sadhana. Uh, people have been practicing spiritual disciplines, but it's quite possible that they can do that even for a number of years or even decades prior to actually being qualified to understand them. It's uh, sort of uh, uh, contradiction, I know, and it sounds that way, and it looks that way on the world, too. But <clears throat> it's called Adi Chara, Adhikara Vichara, as you can see on this chart that we looked at first and last week, and we went through one side of it, and we looked at the three main darshanas of India, probably called main because they happen to be still in, uh, they, they still have a spiritual life. Some of the others have been absorbed into them. <clears throat> and those are basically Vedanta, which is certainly at the forefront of all of them right now. You would, might want to say yoga, but of course yoga has been sort of co-opted and used as a physical, a regimen of physical exercises or called asanas. And you won't find that listed uh, uh, very much in the Vedantic disciplines or in Patanjali's yoga. There's only a, a very little mention of that. It takes up about a uh, part of one limb of yoga and a, a lower limb at that. And then there is um, Samkhya. Samkhya yoga, it's called. Samkhya yoga really means the yoga of varieties. If we look at the Bhagavad Gita, you'll see that there are uh, the very second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita after Arjuna becomes dejected. Uh, Vishada, it's called, uh, the yoga of dejection or depression. And Krishna exhorts him to rise out of that fallen place. And he starts listing or enumerating the tattvas, the various things that are available to the human being and to Arjuna fallen on the battlefield at that time to help lift himself up based upon principles known to all, as the Upanishads say. So he's really calling him to focus on details first uh, and not just try and jump to the highest because his mind's in a dejected place. In the same way, when your mind is in an unqualified place and you try and practice spiritual disciplines given by the acharya or by the guru or by the teacher, uh, then it's... <clears throat> Not likely that that's going to last very long. That's why people are giving up spiritual life, giving up gurus, giving up mantras, and giving up studying the scriptures, all three of which are very crucial for this process of adhikara vichara. That's atma vichara we know from as far back as jnana vishishta, that is Lord Vishishta's yoga, right up to the present time, more present time in terms of Ramana Maharshi, who is probably the greatest living being of the 20th century from India, the greatest, best-known seer, although Vivekananda made it a little bit into that century. So uh, one left off, or the, one picked up where the other left off, you might say. But, but all of those souls, a long sweep of time, many millennia, were very insistent upon qualifying yourself to be able to understand these precious teachers teachings. Otherwise, the saying is that it, it just goes right over your head and you miss so much. Even a very adamant and dedicated student, like my teacher used to say, of a, of a, a, a dedicated student or disciple of a dualistic path is likely to miss a lot of the subtleties 
that could be caught in the open mind if the mind were qualified in some of these darshanas, which we'll be looking at today in a, in a deeper way from the standpoint of their dynamics. So maybe without a long preamble, as sometimes I want to do, we could pick up where we left off last time, although I will bring back the two rivers idea of Vedanta and Tantra in a chart I didn't quite finish last time. But this chart here, I think, will come to the rescue of some of us who may already feel like we're, uh, our chin is above water and we're about to go under and drown in all of these words and all of these philosophies. Um, actually, a better word would be darshanas, these paths of clear seeing. <clears throat> and um, so that you're aware of the fact that this is not just for a few individuals, this study of the whole sweep of India's great teachings, because they 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 have the distinction of being able to to um, interconnect with one another. Because each period of time that went by, that darshana that was previous was checked by the most recent um, seer of the next darshana, say from Samkhya and then leading on into later centuries, millennia, yoga, and Vedanta. Uh, this was all being checked by great souls, and so they had concurrence amongst them. And number one, they weren't arguing with each other, debating about what was true and what wasn't. They all had come to this deep conviction, what I'm calling here a consensus and a conclusion, around these truths that... Uh, are based upon basically attributes and qualities known to everyone, like the existence of things rather than the non-existence of things. You don't really take up the non-existence of things until they start to disappear in samadhi. And so in the meantime, you, when you're qualifying yourself, you take name and form and time and space and you meditate upon them. You take earth and water and fire and air and ether in a row from outside in, and you meditate on them, and you connect them. Some people, maybe unqualified, might get to the Yoga 101, where they're looking at a candle in a windless place and trying to concentrate their mind, or uh, watching a flower bloom or something. Uh, the old adages that were used even back in the 60s when, when some of this Indian darshana broke on the scene, in the, mostly in the form of Tantra and Yoga. And Vedanta was going to come along and school us in a deeper way about these precious truths. So in, in the meantime, it was possible that you were beginning to get the idea of meditating upon the elements and upon where to connect them, back to the senses, of course. So senses and elements were all widely scattered and dispersed, and you were using them one at a time. Now I'm seeing, now I'm hearing, as you read a book, you hear music, now it's dinner time, I'm smelling and tasting. And so you were using all of these attributes known to all, they're called tattvas, just sort of uh, out of hand, so sort of as a matter of course, everyone did it. But to concentrate on one of them and trace it back to its source, as I've often said and tried to try to make a popular teaching out of it again, uh, was the special task of the father of yoga when he he came after some 500, 600 years after the Buddhist period had first come and made its first appearance and disappearance uh, as a popular darshana from India. And then all of a sudden, um, you had the father of yoga coming up with words like uh, a station for meditation. You needed something to meditate on. This would be good for both of those who hadn't yet made connections between these sets of fives that were going on, on one hand, unintended, and on the other hand, hadn't, were not ready for non-duality or were trying to jump to the highest step, as Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa said, and falling down, or if they could make the highest step, not being aware of how they got there and how to come back. That's not knowing what the middle steps consisted of. 
So he had some saying where he was saying, if you just jump from the lowest step to the highest step, and the lower step is mortar and dust and stone, you know, and, and cement, and you jump to the highest step and you find out the highest step is also made of that same material, the five elements and so forth, but you didn't know that the steps in between were also what they were made of, then that's a kind of lack of qualification on your part. And you'll not know this Adi Daiva Vidya that Samkhya Yoga first came out with when it talked about the 24 cosmic principles. I think that's kind of where we ended last class as we were talking about Samkhya Yoga and didn't quite finish it. So I could say this chart that we're about to look at is going to come along and flush this out. See, we're going to we're going to make it uh, possible to to not just list the points, which it does for you nicely here, under different headings. Vedanta basically very well known for the not this not this approach of weeding the garden. Uh, of the mind, that is, and potentially known more for this eight-limbed approach that you could climb the tree to the highest state of consciousness. Again, you would probably have to know what each one of those limbs consisted of and how to mount them and climb them, just like the stairs. Uh, and then Samkhya, very well known for Tattvavid. So this is coming from future and looking back. Basically, Samkhya was first uh, in this run of three, and then in time, Ashtanga Yoga was put together as a system by Patanjali, the eight-limbed version of it. And then Veda Vyasa and Vedanta came about just about the time when the Upanishads, which these two darshanas had based a lot of their knowledge on, were disappearing. And Veda Vyasa was able to claim some of them. So now we have some 108 Upanishads, the same amount of beads on your mala, for instance, very auspicious number in our tradition. Uh, so easy to remember that these these four Vedas are broken into these 108 Upanishads, which were different schools that were being taught. So all of this to say then that this qualification process that's going on falls in our lap here in this day and time. And we we probably ought to be aware of it, especially if we're, we're students of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, that is, if we're the children of a great soul like that, or um, the sons and daughters of Swami Vivekananda, then we probably, probably ought to know uh, what they were in knowledge of and how they uh, attained such a high position and still were able to remain, retain a body and function and uh, spread the Dharma and the, the Atma Gyan, which I chanted about at the beginning of this class, and the truth, the non-dual truth as well from all levels of their being, and they were naturally equipped to do that. So these are examples of people coming into the world already completely mature. Yesterday, we had the example of the, of the gourd, you know, the, the squash, you know, fruit uh, first, flower later, uh, and most other vegetables in the garden, you know, uh, uh, flower first, then oh, it's going to fly. It's going to fruit, and then the fruit starts to starts to come out. So Sri Ramakrishna, Sri Sharada Devi, Swami Vivekananda are like beings who came to Earth fully developed already, and they're showing us the flower of their realization from a fully developed condition of absolute, not just qualification, but but realization. So I guess the idea here would be to start start. Zen mind, beginner's mind, as they used to say in, in the 60s about Zen, and the Roshis came over, and then began to slowly, from that, that stage, by a vasta, by a vasta uh, qualify yourself in stages, how to view the five elements, how to connect them to the five senses, how to connect those 10 to the Tan Matras, how to connect those 15 uh, and the other five uh, of, of subtle senses, how to connect those to the fourfold mind, and then how to connect that to, to the mahat, to the, and basically you've got 24 cosmic principles there, or 25 if you count all, of, all levels of mind. Four sets of five, or five sets of five. 
So all of this was the basic Adi Daiva Vidya I just mentioned, the original divine knowledge, and it lasted, and is still lasting, because we're talking about it today in this room, for many millennia, from Lord Kapila's system all the way through to yoga used it, and now in Vedanta we're talking about it. So with that much said as a further explanation, um, I think we can, and it might, might take some jockeying back and forth, we can look at this new chart. Uh, I don't know, first maybe uh, show this real quick, and we can look at, at uh, what we looked at briefly on the left-hand side. Basically, there are seven darshanas uh, on this side, on this chart. Uh, uh, basically, seven pathways. The original six darshanas, of course, two of them are not included here. They've actually been absorbed into Vedanta and, and other aspects of, of uh, yoga and so forth. But um, that would be the orthodox way of looking at it. But here you're seeing this new, this, uh, this new dispensation that is represented by the appearance of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and his primary disciple, Swami Vivekananda, seated very nicely here in an ornate oriental chair in a museum, probably in Chicago, I think, uh, in his Western attire with the Indian uh, look to it as he was here amongst us teaching the Vedanta, what we now have come to know maybe as the new form of Vedanta, or the new face of Vedanta. Beautiful picture there of him sitting with his hands clasped. And uh, with all of that wisdom of this listed all around him here in his mind, like all the Upanishads were in Vedavyasa's mind at an earlier age, and he could just write them down. Just ask Ganesh to borrow his tusk for a pen, dip it into the ink, start writing right from his mind. Veda Vyas came up with all these Upanishads, all in memory. Uh, not hard to fathom or imagine, because I know my own teacher, Swami Shishjani Nandaji Maharaj, peace and bliss be upon him, had the whole Bhagavad Gita memorized in both Sanskrit and English. And I have a recording of that on an old 33 LP record that was given to me that he made in Portland, Oregon in the early days before I even came to him. So he's there reciting this, uh, and he would do that uh, from the podium while he fed us prasad and so forth. You'd hear him go back and forth through all the slokas in a row of the Gita, and in English as well as Sanskrit, all in his mind when he was 90, up to when he was in his 90s, when he passed on to Samadhi. <clears throat> so uh, this is how much of a receptacle the mind and memory are if you concentrate on them as a as an alambana as i just said you don't just start with air earth fire water and ether and connect them to the senses this is, these are dynamics of perception that you want to run new grooves for if they've been forgotten by people but they're all leading you to the mind because they're all connected to the mind and mind's their author <coughs> And you want a pure mind and pure thoughts, chit shuddhi. And uh, so that's more the point, but you don't want to jump stages or, or jump steps. You want to know how everything connects and participate in it. So just quickly, you can see here from Samkhya that they're talking about, let me read it real quick, the 24 cosmic principles air, earth, fire, water, and ether, tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, and smelling, and how they have come out, how consciousness has marched out with them. Then the three kinds of suffering, trividam, dukkham, uh, that was uh, many millennia before Lord Buddha came along with the Four Noble Truths, starting with there is suffering. Then the 30 tenets of Samkhya Yoga, I'm sorry, 10 tenets of Samkhya Yoga, I can bring you a chart on that if we want. And the nine complacencies and the great accomplishments, eight great accomplishments, those would be some of the features that you would, you would find if you said, I want to qualify myself in Samkhya Yoga. I want to know what the earliest original divine wisdom of the Indian seers was, and then how it kept going from age to age, 
and how consciousness moves in and out on these stairways, on these steps. It would be like coming to a river and there's stones across it, and you're jumping from stone to stone. So the first, there's five stones there, and you jump, jump to the to earth, uh, water, fire, air, and ether, and then you then you go on jumping. Thanks to those five stones, you jump to the five senses, and so forth. You make your way across the river that way, accounting for all of these principles known to all. That's the second time I've quoted that from the Upanishads. These are based. This wisdom is based on principles known to everyone. What that says to me is that we're not accounting for what's around us. There are philosophies that can discount what's around you, very high-minded philosophies. They're not real. It's empty. It's not going to satisfy you. You can take those approaches, but you can also take the approach that, like, say, of Tantra, that all this is the divine expression. And Vedanta will concur with that after you've got realization, but on the way, it's not giving you that perspective. It doesn't want you to get caught up if you're not qualified in the lack of ability to renounce these things as being unreal. So that's the cutting here, you know, as I used to say. Uh, but Samkhya will take you from the, from the ground up. And as we're looking at these three main darshanas, let's read yoga real quick to remind ourselves they're going to want you to concentrate on these quintuplications because Kapila um, listed them here, sets of fives. And they're going to want you to uh, um, review and make sure that you're in possession of yamas and niyamas. Are you nonviolent? Are you truthful? Are you free of covetousness? Uh, are you moderate, as I just chanted at the beginning of class, Brahmacharina? Are you moderate in your sensual appetites, or maybe even fully renounced in them, in the case of monastics? And the niyamas of studying scriptures, doing austerity, all of these are the first two limbs of yoga. So those are very important for qualification. Uh, if you have just a few of them, and then you go on to meditation, which is uh, much later, then what can you expect that your meditations won't be fruitful and realization won't come through the eight limb yoga? You'll just get practice in a few um, levels, but there'll be gaps in your awareness. Patanjali himself says that there are gaps in the mind's vibrations in meditation. You go, uh, you turn off, it shuts down, then you come back and you've actually been in some sort of a sleepy state, which is one of the four problems of meditation. And then you ask your teacher, did I have samadhi? And no, no, you don't know when you have samadhi. Uh, you've, right now you've got this uh, these, uh, a list of maybe five or six different problematic vrittis that, that he lists in the system. Talk about qualifying yourself in study of the mind. Yoga does that very well. So you've been under the uh, Chitta Vritti regimen. I think that's uh, could be put here too. Yoga also wants you to qualify yourself. Come out to find out about Kriya Yoga, which are three of these ten yamas and yamas. Your breathing has to be evened out and utilized and known at where it's connected to prana to psychic prana, and the Chitta Vrittis. There they are. So you have to be um, calmed, uh, and even flatlined. See, there are five kinds of mind, and one of them's just rat erratic. One of them's uh, depressed. One of them's depressed, then up, then depressed, and then up. See, so like a dog, you got uh, you got to give doggy downers or puppy uppers, they said, you know, to get the mind is like a dog like that. Sometimes it's down, sometimes it's up. So that's the third kind of mind. But there's a type of chitta vritti that evens out, which people have sometimes in deep sleep, but they need to have it consciously when they're awake. That's just one state of consciousness, like steady wisdom is the result of that. Um, Krishna mentions that, stiti pragnasya in the Gita, and then Prachahar, uh, 
that's a, that's a limb of yoga that people fall off on. About five limbs up, they're looking up longingly at the sixth, seventh, and eighth limbs of concentration, meditation, samadhi, and as they look up, they slip. <laughs> and they come tumbling back down to a lower limb, or maybe flat on the ground, face down. And get up again and have to try and ascend again, which is a problem too, because Patanjali had mentioned that you, if you fail once, it begins to convince your mind that you can't succeed. So the more times you fail, the more you have this weakness in your mind, thinking, I can't do it, I can't do it. You find that in children, when you're teaching them in school, and maybe teachers know this, and and you, you might come in contact with it if you work with children at all. Say, I can't do it. Some of them say, I can't do it. So where did that idea come from at so young an age that they're, that's their mantra? It came from a past lifetime of, of failures. So in spiritual life, it's particularly true that you've got people who are falling off the tree of yoga or falling off these, uh, this, the, st- the qualification techniques that they should be doing. And... Uh, gaining this habit of uh, failure when they should be making one assault on the pinnacle of truth and continue to the goal. You want to start qualified, start out qualified, and make uh, one ascent on the on the gates of non-duality. And basically, that's getting ahead of the Prachahara game here. But this is what yoga has you thinking about Ashtanga, eight limb, has you thinking about right away. And then Vedanta, you could say, it says neti neti, it's one of its great teachings. It wants you to do the four qualifications. Uh, that is uh, basically sadhana chatushtaya, means these four aspects of practice. Vivika, vairagya, the six jewels, and, and uh, the desire for liberation if you want to put it into one sentence. And then they want you to look at your body-mind mechanism. It's called the pancha kosha, the five levels of your being. It's, it's the best of all systems that convinces the soul that it's not the body. It's one of the best ways of convincing the soul, unarguably, that it's not the body. Because you can say that to people, but they're not going to believe it, as is on record now for the last 50 years, maybe and maybe even 150 since Vivekananda got here and gave him that Vedanta 101 teaching, you're not the body, okay, I'll believe you. But then they're acting like the body, and they're still inhabiting the body. They don't know how to renounce the body, and they begin to turn everything physical, everything material, and ensconced in matter. So if you take a teaching of the Panchakoshas that qualifies you to to go beyond the body, to the energy, to the mind, to the intellect, and to this ego that's at the root of everything. So it's, uh, you talk about that sword, that sword cut at a high place, that has its uses. The four yogas were put in here, and probably this could only be said because of this great soul here that we're looking at on this chart. Because the last time we heard of that really, uh, and anyone who was really taking it seriously was in the time of Sri Krishna when he mentioned it. Bhagavad Gita, he says that after he's raised Arjuna out of his depression, he said, and there are Chaturdasya yoga, there's these four yogas you need to practice now, young man, so that you never fall back into this depression again and this situation with ancestors, family, war, violence, evil persons. Uh, yeah, what, what caused you to have to deal with that? in this way, uh, not very timely, not very auspicious, but uh, maybe uh, auspicious enough so that he can earn himself a great teacher like Sri Krishna, uh, because he thought of Krishna as his, his benefactor and his friend before the battlefield. Now he's on the battlefield with this problem. Krishna starts revealing everything that he is to Arjuna, and Arjuna is just, uh, well, you see by some of those later chapters that he brings him completely out of the darkness of Thomas into Rajas and into the light of Sattva and even beyond. So this is what the four yog- yogas, uh, if you look at that, they have, um, they have a, a new rebirth part of, as part of the new dispensation of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. 
And there's no better representative of that that we can see than Swami Vivekananda. And then Triguna Titananda, the teaching of the three gunas, which I just mentioned, Thomas Rogers and Sattva, those also have to be, um, uh, you have to work your way through those and forbear them and transcend them. So you can be Triguna Tita. Atita means to be beyond the three qualities of nature. So you are working yourself back, some people would say, to go beyond nature, but some deeper teacher might say, to know that all nature has come out of you, and you should be the master of it. This is going to be three different looks at nature. Koivalya definitely was there at the very beginning, as the word that uh, Lord Copfield used in Sampkya, for isolating the soul from nature. So it's been in the mind of India since its earliest, the earliest appearance of these great systems like this original divine wisdom of Somkhya. So with that as a quick run through to warm us up again to, to uh, last week's class, and we're just taking three of these greater systems that can qualify ourselves for spiritual path. Let's look at this new chart and look at the dynamics of what we were just saying about that. Now I'm basing this chart on two great sayings that we heard from Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. And first is Sri Ramakrishna's at the top. You see that he's talking about stages towards liberation. So there is a, as Buddha called it, a paragatam, a supreme goal that's beyond other goals. Gatam, gatam, paragatam is like a statement of people saying, it's okay to have these goals to help, like the goals of qualifying yourself, uh, you, you know, better to take that step by step than jump to the top of the stairs and not know what you're doing. So you are qualifying yourself with these goals. Some of them are in the world, some of them are in religion, some of them are in philosophy, and some of them are in, uh, in uh, spiritual life, per se, and the ones we're concerned that the darshanas are most concerned with are in spiritual life. So these are accomplishments and attainments in Indian darshana. Sri Ramakrishna said in the gospel, the sanatana dharma, which means all of this, all of this is sanatana dharma, you could find all aspects of that great religion of the ancient rishis there on this chart and, and more. So he says, the Sanatana Dharma, the eternal religion declared by the Indian rishis, will alone endure. The soil of India is different. Only what is true survives here. So even at the... this. Kali Yuga, this late Yuga, where people have lost most memory of their, of their, um, of these great systems, like Samkhya, for instance. We, most people don't hear about that or get to learn of it. In the Gospel of Ramakrishna, you will be hearing about these tattvas, and in some of the scriptures prior to that, you'll be learning about them too, like Sri Krishna listing the, the tattvas uh, in the. Samkhya Yoga chapter I just mentioned. He's talking about his nature, his lower nature, his eightfold body, and then his higher nature, and his, his nature that goes beyond both lower and higher. This is all like what Samkhya wants to lead you towards realization of. So you too can say, I'm not the, I'm not the eightfold body, uh, and I'm not the five elements of nature. I have a supreme self called Atman. That's what I really am. So it works for the great soul, the archetypical soul, Sri Krishna. It should be a version of that that works for you, too. You see, That you can also claim, I and my father are one at some time. And so that's, that's the richness of this tradition. So Sri Ramakrishna is mentioning that. Uh, what I what I really wanted to ferret out of the letters of Swami Vivekananda and, some, and his perspective was in this next quote. Uh, this pretty much acts as a preface to everything we want to look at in these darshanas over the next uh, month of Sundays. We're in the second Sunday now. So he says here, and I quote him, you must pay special attention to study. 
set about collecting everything that books, beginning with the Rig Veda down to the most insignificant of Puranas and Tantras, have got to say about creation and annihilation of the universe, about race, about heaven and hell, the soul's consciousness and intellect, etc. Sense organs, mukti, which is liberation, transmigration, and such like things. No child's play will do. I want really scholarly work. For I am strongly of the opinion that very few persons in any yuga attain jnanam. Therefore, we should go on striving and striving even unto death. So one of the things we'd want to do with this life when we found that we had enough, because back to the yamas and yamas of yoga, we don't want to cover, covet more, cover the things of other people. Um, we have enough. We have enough money. We have enough um, children. <laughs> we have enough relationships. We have enough food. All of this is provided for us in a society that um, India once was, uh, even up to present times to a certain extent, and definitely in the opulent societies of the Western cultures of nowadays. So we should then have enough of that. What we want more of is time for study. And Lord Buddha was saying that in, when he was living too. You need more time to study uh, how your ancestors have led you into samsara and how you have, you have gone tied hand and foot with them like sheep. Uh, the rust of families, family life, and the rust of monasteries has come upon you, he said. And uh, because you have not seen Maya, but I have seen Maya, he said. I've, I've seen that, uh, that um, there's an architect to all of this. And uh, that it comes, it, can, it needs to be brought crashing down like a house of straws. So he was talking in these terms about um, gaining success in the old wisdom that had been forgotten because of this, this uh, ancestor worship and ritual that had taken over that. It was a problem in India uh, after Buddha left, too, for several thousand years. That's how Vivekananda put it when he showed up later. So this... Um, you could use this then to ferret out some time for yourself to look back in history and see how these great systems have come forward and are available to you right now, what the dynamics are of perception, how to, how to make them live again in you, how to remember them. And according to Vivekananda here in the statement, you can see what he thinks. He wants you to study and look into the old books. He often said that, I can prove everything that I'm saying to you by India's old books. It's one of his quotes that he used to use. So he wasn't somebody to throw scriptures out the window uh, because he thought maybe they're antiquated or old and not useful anymore. He wanted them brought back and studied. He said, uh, he said that about uh, Dhammapada, Quran, and Vedas. He said, these, these are the three great books of these three traditions in India. He said, we'll never know anything by throwing them away. You have to get them and study them. Then you can go beyond them. So he wants you to know all of these ancient principles that have been written down by realized souls and bring this back current in your mind, which is what we're trying to do in this month of Sundays. And what we've been trying to do in SRV for America and for people in the world in general over the last three decades. So look at this again. What does he want us uh, to remember? You want to know what they say about creation and annihilation of the universe. Well, there it is right there in the Samkhya. See, how everything got created by the, in the 24 cosmic principles and how it all gets uh, dissolved. How it evolves, if you want to put it in scientific terms, and how it involves. Because if you take to the modern savants of the West, they'll show you maybe in some ways how it evolves. 
not not accounting for the fact that the consciousness in it doesn't evolve and involve. It's a witness, but the tattvas do, and the tattvas are born of the mind. So all of these things that come all the way down to the element earth trace their way back to uh, earth from water, earth and water from fire, earth, water, and fire from air, earth, wire, water, fire, uh, and uh, uh, air from ether, you see. So now you found yourself back to one of the ancient teachings of India called the five ethers. So that's here that we'll look at that. Five kinds of space that you're only aware of one of them nowadays. And you think that that's all there is, and then the soul dies, or if there is even a soul involved in it. If you're the body, that's the soul, that dies. So this is the way people are thinking in these, this day and age. So this is, I'm going through this quote to tell you that he wants you to use these teachings and look back. Part of the qualification process now for us must be destroying ignorance. Or put it in another way, reviving our memory of this wisdom, because it's all within us. All knowledge is within you. Kingdom of heaven is within you. These are statements of great souls uh, who know knows that every, everything lies back in the mind. And there's a memory for that, and that you need to activate it and access it. So that's the first thing he says. Start talking, reading the scriptures, and talking with your guru and your your fellow seekers about creation and annihilation of the universe. Pretty soon you'll be able to uh, toss some of these theories of science on their ear and get rid of them. We don't believe in them anymore. They happen only on one level. Uh, but our, our soul is on the highest level. It's witnessing this in cycles. That's what Lord Buddha was talking about, ancestor cycles. So you want to um, throw out the old, destroy the superstitions of religion that's outdated, and bring in this new dispensation that these great souls are talking about. What else? Next, also find out what they say about races, what the scriptures say about heaven and hell, what it says about the soul, about consciousness and intellect, what it says about the sense organs. So as we climb our way up, you see, you're finding, if you're meditating on the quintuplications, those five of those are the sense organs, aren't they? So this one quote is just a revisiting of all these points that I've just related to you that we've looked at twice now in two Sundays. It's just a revisitation in his own words of what he knows and how he wants you to remember all of this. What it says about mukti, let's see, liberation, which is the name of this chart. What it says about uh, transmigration, what the scriptures say about souls coming and going. If, so if you, if you look at that under the regime of any one of these systems, from the very earliest, uh, that's called koivalya, that the soul put on nature, and now it's divesting itself of it. And nothing happened to the soul when it was putting on this garment and when it was taking it off. The soul remained the same, unchanged. And you'll find that that fact is at the foundation of every one of these darshanas. That's how India went about studying Maya, from the standpoint of the changelessness of reality. And we don't do that in our systems of, of knowledge, which they call lower knowledge. We think everything's based in change. Our birth has changed, our life has changed. Uh, going from liberation, if you even began to think about it in Western philosophy, you'd be going from, from uh, birth to death, from the cradle to the grave, my guru used to say, thinking that that's an actual process that's happening to you. But that only happens in nature to your body and senses. So you need to study them to make sure that you can just um, detach yourself from body and senses. And then you could see how the souls bought into this idea of that it's moving from place to place. But where's the space it will move to when all of space is in the soul, he said. 
And uh, where's the time which it will come and go in when all of time is in your soul? So things like space and time and change and all that are actually in your self. And you, when you use them and you project a body onto the earth, using the five senses and five elements all coming from the mind, then that's what you've forgotten, isn't it? You come here to earth, and they don't teach you that in our Western countries, hardly taught anymore to people in India, I think. I said, this is the old ancient wisdom that's going to tell you as soon as you can draw a breath or as soon as you can form a thought that this is what happened to you. This is how you got here. So you don't ask the question anymore, where did I come from? That's just idiocy. We already told you that. You've known that for lifetimes. Now the question is whether or not you want to come again, you see. And if you don't, study this and don't come again. It's up to you. There's no devil doing it to you. Or there's no God wanting you to do it. It's, it's all in you. You are that. You are that devil. You are that God to yourself. So this is what he means by steady transmigration. You have to study it with systems that have have seers that have already looked at it and have renounced it. I'm not going to take a body again, you see. No more birth in the womb of matter for me, only emanation from my divine mother. I see all the lips moving because I've said this so often that they've memorized it. It's a beautiful line from Ram Prasad's song. No more birth in the womb of matter for me, only emanation from my divine mother. So you're this ray coming from the sun, and you go back to the sun when the sun sets. And the setting and the rising of the sun is all uh, also non-factual. A man has come to me from a land that never sleeps. I learned this all-encompassing way from a man uh, who who uh, uh, in a land who, where the sun never rises and sets. Now I've put all my, changed all my dreams to radiant meditations. So these are some of the thoughts that are coming about in a person, a great soul, who has been raised in these systems and even started to write songs about them, you see. So I paused there on transmigration as one of those salambanas that they're going to want you to look at. Also, don't make this child's play. I want really scholarly work. So admittedly, I want to say right now that he was telling this mainly to his brother monks. When you come to America, you want them, you want to do this. You want to read the old books. You want to recover that knowledge which is within you. You want to teach it to them. So, so what if he's giving that order to them? Aren't they giving it to you? Isn't that more the point? So he's not giving it to them so that they'll just come here and pontificate and show you how much they know. They're giving, he's giving it to them and telling them to, to do this so that they'll come here and they, they'll give it to you and you can do the process of qualification. Because until you do, you're not going to understand such uh, abstruse, apparently abstruse systems that uh, have illumined thousands of souls in the Vedic religion. We'll put the word Hindus, Hinduism aside for now. And it's better to call this, like Sri Ramakrishna is saying, the Sanatana Dharma, the land of the eternal religion, of the ancient rishis. This is what they came up with. There's obviously much more to say about this. I hope you're making the connection between this and this, is what I'm saying. Is that this is what, this is giving you the permission, if not the outright instruction, if not the order to do this by Swami Vivekananda. That's why that makes this chart all the more important and all the more valid. So if you look at this, you say, that's too much for me. All you have to do is bring it to mind and practice some of it, and it'll all come dancing back to you. 
just give it a few years. <laughs> it's all in you. Uh, give it a lifetime. So Swami Vivekananda used to say that to his own people, to young men, you know. Uh, I want you to give one lifetime to this. But don't forget that it means you must pay special attention to study. This is my uh, strong opinion. See, that this is what this is the way you're going to awaken yourself from ignorance of the ages. How did Krishna put that in the Gita? Nahi gyanena sadrishyam pavitrami habidyate tat svayam yoga samsiddha kalenat mani vindate. You realize this Atman by the knowledge that's in it, by the knowledge systems that lead to realization of the ocean of the Atman, because it destroys ignorance. Nahi gyanena sadrishyam pavitram iha vidyate. That vidya, that knowledge is this he's talking about. And it's the greatest purifier of all things. Let's look at these three particularly uh, from this consensus, consensus and conclusion. If you can't read that on the screen, don't worry. I'm going to give it to you. You've got a paper version. You've got my version here. And you've also got... Um, what's on the screen, if you can see it, or look back on it later. But I'll read it to you. So basically, we take Samkhya first. You can see that first block of text has four points to it. What does Samkhya do? This is, this is what I'm trying to say. I said, maybe, basically, uh, how do we qualify ourselves in Samkhya? Well, we have to become aware of all this. That's, that's kind of a lot for people nowadays. But we can put it in four bullet points that may make it a little clearer for you. Samkhya will indicate the distinction between consciousness and matter. It's, again, one of the first things you started out with when, when you were born to a family of rishis, yogis, pious householders, yogis, householder yogis. One of the first things they're going to tell you, and they're waiting for you to be able to grow enough so they can tell you this, they're not routing you into money making right away, for instance, or getting you ready, you know, to uh, become rich or famous or anything. That's not in their minds. They want you to grow intellectually and mentally. And as soon as you're ready, they're going to say, have you noticed the distinction between you and everything here? Your inner self and your outer self, if you want to put it that way, between Purusha and Prakriti. That was the earliest words used. And the other systems along the way, including Sri Krishna and the Gita, used these terms, Purusha and Prakriti. So basically, that's the first bullet point of Sankhya. Just think to yourself, I am Purusha. I am the sentient soul. And Prakriti is insentient nature. Make that distinction. Because... Thousands of years later, Christ told his people, separate the wheat from the chaff. That's precisely what was being taught millennia earlier by the Indian seers who, just, who wanted it to be brought out first and foremost to people who were doing what? Huh? What's that you say? Transmigrating. See? The people who were caught on the wheel of samsara. See? They had to awaken. So that's why you want to know about everything in the past that was said about transmigration, so that you can re-inform yourself about that, destroy the doubts around it, and say to yourself, right now I think I'm a transmigrating soul, but my teachers tell me that's not true. How could you make a statement like that if you didn't qualify yourself in the highest opinion given by the teachers? You're doubting it? You're, you're running away from it? You're preferring pleasure. You're fearing it. Uh, you think it's too much work for you. You can't qualify yourself and so forth. So you have to sell, say to yourself, right now I'm transmigrating. I'm moving from heaven to earth to hell. That's what all traditions are telling you. Whether they're calling you know, hell uh, bardos or whether, and they're calling heaven... Um, uh, um, locas, see, 
or they're calling hell samsara, or whether they're calling uh, earth and heaven uh, up above me, you know, with, with a god in the clouds. No matter what they're thinking about in, in religions, then you're going to have to say, I'm moving from heaven to earth to hell. And I renounce that idea now. I don't move. My soul doesn't move. And there you have the consensus, consensus and the conclusion of the seers. You finally arrived at it, and you get thee behind me, is how Jesus put that. He saw people laboring with doubt about these truths because they hadn't, Judaism hadn't kept up with that dharma of their religion. And it's happened to India too that they didn't. So you forget these things. You begin to transmigrate. You begin to accept that's the truth. In our time, you think that you evolve, that and evolution is all there is. And you can only trace yourself, you know, back to the monkeys or the apes. See? Go to the zoo to see your relatives, my teacher used to say, but he's not buying it. The soul is free of all transmigration. So that would be the conclusion, the consensus and the conclusion of realized souls who had put it down in the scriptures. And all you have to do is read that and understand it and accept it. And you've qualified yourself in that particular darshana and you won't do that much. Then, you know, what can be done with you as the seeing goes? It's, it's, it's like fruit waiting to be picked and you're not picking it. Meanwhile, you're sitting around saying, oh, this class is too hard, you see. Uh, that's too much to know, but you just need to know the essentials. Let's take another bullet point, see how that works. Sampya also reveals how consciousness enters and departs bodies and forms. That's called tattvas, the 24 cosmic principles. So how did I get here? A stork brought you and dropped you in the chimney, you see. But you, back in the ancient times in India, how did I get here? In sets of fives, you came out of the mind as a projection of, of your true self. Uh, the body is just an outer manifestation of the inner self. It's, it's a reflection in a mirror you're looking at here. All of nature's like that. So here's what nature consists of. The great mind, the fourfold mind, intellect, manas, buddhi, so forth, the five subtle senses, the five time mantras, the five gross senses, and the five elements of earth, air, fire, water, and ether. Is that too much to know? Didn't you learn much more difficult things in college when you went there? Much more difficult things. Algebra, science, mechanics. So here's the mechanics of the mind for you. All you need to know is that in order to know how you got here. Then you can tell your children, you didn't come from a stork. And uh, uh, you didn't come out of nothing, which is basically what they're telling you. Medicine and science, you came out of nature. But nobody tells you that nature came out of you. And it came out of you in sets of fives. And who's the you they're talking about here? Your mind. It's a projection, not a creation. All of a sudden, all these great teachings come running back at you to wash over you and waken you up to your true nature. So Sampya will do that for you if you study it. It'll reveal how consciousness enters and departs bodies. So if you're talking about, you're worried about death? There, well, there is no death. There's just consciousness divesting itself of things that die. <laughs> See? Everything dies and decays. Look at your Buddhist teachings, birth, growth, decays, old age, decay, death, the six transformations. What did he say up here? Transmigration and everything that changes, you want to know about that. Once you know about it, your fear dies, your doubt goes away. Okay. And now you can walk around the earth looking at everything outside of you and saying, uh, those are stepping stones I came out on. And in sleep tonight, 
I'll draw them back in. In meditation tonight, I'll draw them back in. And at death, I'll draw them back in. Because you know the dynamics of perception. And you've connected all the dots. People are, are, are sometimes making much too big a thing about enlightenment. I mean, this is enlightenment when you find this out. It can only lead to enlightenment. It'll, it, it'll slap you in the face and wake you up. Plus, especially when you put it next to the thickness of your own ignorance. You've been thick as a brick all this time, maybe for lifetimes. The simple truth has been transplanted again and again in the soil of different races, different cultures, different philosophical systems. All you need to do is inspect it and put an emphasis on it. Third point of Sampya explains the nature of suffering and impediments in embodied life. We call that the gunas. So Vedanta might boast about gunas, you know, and how it how to get beyond them, but it was back in Lord Kapila's time that the teaching was first given out in a, in, a, in a composed system to study. You need to know about the three gunas. That's the most unique way that the Rishi said anyone in the world has ever come up with to told you why sometimes you're depressed, sometimes you're restless, and sometimes you're balanced. A psychiatrist can't even tell you that. They can't give you any real ground for the changes of the mind. That's yoga psychology that does that. So go there, you see. Go there and study it. It gives the order and grouping of evolutes along with their involution process. That's called sanchara. Sancharana means creation, basically. So sanchara prati sancharaha is one of the ancient Sanskrit sayings in the Tatma Samasa Sutras of one of the students, probably, of Lord Kapila. So old, we, can't, we don't even have that access to those scriptures anymore, except just one or two of them. So, Sancharaha Prati Sancharaha. Imagine hearing that at the beginning of an age, like thousands of years ago, and you had a set of lifetimes ahead of you, in ignorance. And you heard that everything comes out in an order and everything returns in that reverse order. That's what those three words mean. So you look at air, earth, fire, water, and ether, they came out of the five senses. You look at those 10, they came out of the subtle senses and the tanmatras. You look at those 20 and they came out of the mind. And now I'm availed of the tattvas and how everything evolves, but then involves again. Right away, I'm sidestepping this premature and dangerous conclusion that I'm born and I die. I, I project and I withdraw. That's what I do. And the birthless, death, deathless soul does that with its facile mind. There's no birth and death in that. That's why Sri Krishna tells Arjuna in the Gita, Know that just a little bit of this yoga will save you from the great fear. You're going to have to study it and inspect it, think about it, and then hopefully accept it and draw a consensus with the great souls and make a conclusion about it. A siddhanta around it. Vedanta siddhanta narukti resha brahmaiva jiva ham sakalam jagadcha. They say, Shankara says in the scriptures, it's, just, it's the highest conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. This is all Brahman. So how can I qualify myself to know that? That wasn't too painful, was it? Four bullet points about Samkhya Yoga, the, the ancient, maybe the most ancient of all systems that were really authored by an illumined soul. Lord Kapila, if you say that word even nowadays in India, you get two hands put together. Even if they don't, haven't studied or if they've forgotten the system, oh yes, Kapila. It's like saying Krishna. Right? 
And in fact, in the Gita, Krishna says, of all sages, I am popular. So you're studying the system of the Lord here. You're studying God's own wisdom. Maybe you don't know that because it's coming to you through this vehicle called the Divine Mother. And she's, she's so hidden when she delivers it to you. It's like germs that, that kill you. You, know, you don't even know where they came from and all of a sudden you're sick. But she comes with this wisdom that awakens you. And one day you wake up and say, my ignorance is gone, gone, utterly gone. Because she delivered you this wisdom through some vehicle of hers. And it was ancient wisdom. And there's nothing that can live through it. No germ can live through that. On any level, physical to spiritual or to mental, the germs all get destroyed by this wisdom. Nahi Gyanena. This wisdom is the greatest purifier you're having all these great beings say this to you. From Ram to Ramakrishna, from Vishishta to Vivekananda, through the sweep of time, they're all in consensus and they've come to these conclusions and they continue to be born illumined. I'm not going to earth now to get illumined. Krishna says that. So that I, I don't come here for anything but the highest good of this world. So he's not, it doesn't have anything to gain. If you're sitting pretty, philosophically speaking, and then a great soul comes to you and tells you this, now it's time to remember that. See, so you'll, you'll get books together. You'll read them, make sure you have it really in hand. And a handful of you will follow Vivekananda to the West and give these teachings out to the Americans. Swami Bedananda, Swami Turiyananda, Swami Triguna Titananda, uh, th these souls that we just celebrated their birthdays of, so many of them, he told them, come here. You know, they really need this wisdom. The world is sinking like an ark in greed and lust. You know, come down with me. Share this wisdom with them again. So let's take another one. And isn't this fun? I'm playing off this chart, but this is just you know, some of the bullet points that are more the things you want to know so you can go look for them. But I'm giving you here what they mean, what the dynamics are of them. So in yoga, we were talking about quintuplications, kriya yoga, breathing, controlling the thoughts of your mind, chitta vrittis. What does that equate to here? In yoga, first, yoga provides a comprehensive sadhana designed to purify all aspects of being. We're calling that ashtanga, which is a great clue right away, if you should even need it, that yoga is an eight-limb system, not one-limbed. And its goal is to take you beyond meditation, not just being able to meditate, because people have been meditating for 10 and 20, 30, 50 years and have not gotten enlightened through it. But if you're taking up something like the four yogas, which we will get to here in a minute, this is one of them, Ashtanga Yoga. So this is what you're going to have to qualify yourself in. It's the yoga of Ganam. I'm of the opinion that very few people get it in any yuga. And then there's a bhakti yoga for devotees, and then there's a, a karma yoga for the active. And there's a yoga of, of uh, meditation, an intellectual yoga too. So this is what yoga is going to give you a comprehensive practice, all-inclusive. What else? Encourages concentration upon created principles as divine expressions. That's one reason why if you put yoga together with Tantra, it makes such a beautiful hybrid. Because Tantra has already, already been schooled, or if you're a true Tantrasist, you've already been schooled in the fact 
that all of this is divine expression. It, it needs to be deified before it can be renounced properly. That is, when you deify it, it turns into Brahman, so you don't really have to renounce it. It's, oh, there's Brahman coming out from hiding. Which is Tantra's beautiful turn. We'll hopefully get to that in the next week or two. Third, defines states of mind and teaches the art of controlling and neutralizing thoughts. That's the chitta vrittis. Uh, probably, although it was there back in Vashishtha's time, and he's teaching it to Ram. Of course, it's been with the Indian Rishis and back with Lord Kapila. Brought out as a specific practice, this, this art of concentration was being taught by Patanjali in that unique way. That you need to, and as everyone now, even using it in Tibetan Buddhism and using it in Zen and so forth, is looking back on that teaching of really whether they know it or not, looking back in that teaching of Patanjali where he's talking about the chitta vrittis. Watch your thoughts. And uh, so that's at least almost 2,000 years old when you, when you take it up in the, under the heading of yoga. It's watching your thoughts is that old. We have versions of it in the West in the 60s and 70s. They started to pick up on some of that. You know, use your thoughts positively and so forth and so on. Vedanta was talking about Pratipaksha Bhavanam. St. Francis and, and other Christian mystics were talking about keeping your thoughts uh, devoted and pure. So it's, it's been there through religions and through ages all the time. But turned into a system like this, you've got to assign it to the father of yoga. He defined the states of mind, five of them. I actually went through them about 20 minutes ago in this class. And then he teaches you the art of controlling your thoughts. That would be like placing them on the alambanas, would be one of them. If your mind's restless, you know, put a book in front of it, right? Make it one of these books that Vivekananda's encourage you to read. Spend your time wisely that way. And then become a master of your mind, master of your thoughts. How are you going to master atmic realization if you haven't mastered your mind yet? You see, that'd be a question you might want to ask yourself. The, ma the mind is this vibrating thing, and there's a great mind that vibrates too. That's a collective mind that's back deep inside of everything that nobody can purify. Your individual mind's enough for you to try and make pure. And what does make pure mean if not control the thoughts that are coming out of it? See, neutralize them so that they'll follow the yamas and the yamas in, in right fashion, you see. They won't be violent. They won't give rise to violence. They won't give rise to uh, dishonesty. That is ahimsa and sapjam and asteya non-coveting of things that don't belong to you and that probably won't be good for you if you do, are all built into that practice. And that's an observance that is helping you control your chitta vrittis. That's where vrittis become unmanageable, is where you haven't managed with the right tools. And based on the fact that you haven't known the dynamics of perception yet, how things come out and how they move back in. Third, it affirms the presence of reality. Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Uh, skipped it down. In yoga again, number three, it defines states of mind and teaches the art of controlling and neutralizing thoughts. And number four, teaches meditation with the dynamics of perception in accord with levels of awareness. And that's called samadhi. So, as simple as a baby learning how to operate uh, silverware when it begins to grow. You know, so you get, become a stage of a child. It, it pretty soon knows how to operate outer things and become uh, 
competent in that. In the same way in spiritual life, people have to start at that basic, basic of senses and objects. Because controlling the thoughts might be a far cry for them yet. But if they can simply concentrate, as we just said, as yoga wants you to do, concentrate on the dynamics between the two, what, what, what takes place when you act, and what ceases to take place when you don't act, and how that's connected to thoughts, which are a kind of action, and the removal of thoughts, which are a kind of inaction, are the more subtle dynamics of perception in yoga. And so that's, that's uh, Eastern psychology, ancient, ancient. And they've got a consensus about it that it's the best system for practice, yoga, undeniably. So that's why everyone talks about it, including Sri Krishna the Gita. It doesn't matter if you're a bhakta or a jnani or a raji, a meditator. Everyone talks about that. And the conclusions that come out of seers when they actually learn the dynamics of perception and put them on any given thing, an act, a meditation, uh, a study of a scripture, Basically, in yoga, that's leading to what they call samyama, is that you can now concentrate, meditate, and have samadhi. And when you have those three and put them together, it's called samyama. You've taken the upper three limbs of yoga and taken the best fruits, and you're up there picking them, and you're enjoying them, and hopefully you're passing them on to people. Let's take one more in the few remaining minutes. Well, Vedanta, of course, maybe we can start into it and pick it up um, next, next Sunday. Uh, you can hopefully uh, study your notes, look back on these things uh, in accord with what I'm trying to do here between these two charts. And having a little compassion for you, taking up just three darshanas instead of seven listed here, and the nine listed here, all these arms with their nice flames, you know, are, are different Indian darshanas that the seers have um, composed, as it were, and brought forward out of the ancient teachings, all concurring with each other about it, and coming to the same conclusions, which would be down here in the Advaita section, which isn't really a darshana at all, but there was an extra hand there, so I just threw it in there. That's the non-dual essence of things that's so well loved from everyone from, from Vishishta to Lord Buddha to our Swami Vivekananda here. So um, maybe that's enough for you to chew on, and we can start with Vedanta next week and show you some of the dynamics. And in, in that way, maybe instead sing a little bit to Swami Vivekananda to close our class. Samadhista Shiva Svaloke Nirbaram Jananam Karandanad Bhavagno Bhisane Pradhanam Prabhu Ditastvam Yagata Viveka Nandate Prabhate Pranjali Guru Rangripte Tale Svamatmanam Dado Parikshanantaram Bahu Prashnair Risham Vishudai Sevanair Babanstam Pripile Viveka Nandate Prabhate Pranjali Narendra Shashane Narendra Yovane Narendra Kridane Narendra Shikshane Narendra 
Pallene, Naren Rokharpene, Viveka Nandate, Babate Pranjali. For the good of the world, and as an example of discrimination, you scrutinized your guru with thorough questioning and close observations. The eternal verities contained within the Vedic, Vedic religion were then all revealed and explained lucidly by you. This humbled the pride of those who erroneously proclaimed that their own creed was superior to others. By silencing these assumptions, you have opened all minds and paths to truth and drawn attention to a truly universal faith. In this auspicious dawn of illumination, O Vivekananda, we offer you our humble salutations. Om Bhadram Karne Bihi Srinayama Devaha Bhadram Pasyema Akshabirya Jatraha May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual, and hear with these ears what is noble and uplifting. And may we, while living a life which is beneficial to all beings, worship the Mother and the Lord of the universe with all devotion. May all the divine qualities cited in the ancient scriptures and darshanas of India, then abide within us. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us, and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om Hari Om Hari Om Tat Sat.